With that, I'd like to invite my dear friend and CEO of one of the most influential companies, Satya Nadella. You all know him. He needs no introduction. But I want to say a few things about him. As you give him a warm welcome, have a seat, Satya. Satya and I got to meet in the basement of our law building where we first started in Arista almost 10 years ago. You know, I don't know too many CEOs who would have showed up there. We were the shelving area, much like in Silicon Valley, we talk about garages and how we are there. We were in the shelving area of a law building. We had a receptionist. The minute somebody entered, she knew whether they build, belonged in the <laughs> shelving area below with Arista or they belonged in the law firm. When she saw you, she was a little more confused, right? Because you didn't look like you should be at the law firm, but you didn't look exactly like you should be in the, an engineer in the, law, in the shelving area as well. That relationship has transformed si since the years. By the way, I want you to know that law firm went under and Arista went on to become public, so <laughs> things can change very quickly. Um, what, what makes Satya a very unique leader and also very connected to Arista? He's, he's highly empowering, and he's not only a technologist, but he enables technology to make things happen. And so the last 10 years, we have powered Azure. And another story there, uh, uh, Satya, Azure was our first pick for a name as a company. <laughs> we went to search for the domain name, and you had taken it a few weeks earlier. So our, our, our destinies were intertwined right from the beginning, and it's a real pleasure to have you Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Likewise. Thank you so Thank much. You. Have a seat. Now, um, this, in this fireside chat, we have some very specific questions on what I should ask you. I might, re I might veer off the agenda a little <laughs> bit here. Um, but I think, you know, since you became CEO, and even much during your tenure at Microsoft, um, we all have been talking about the cloud and the hybrid cloud. And yet it's really hard. You know, we're talking on one hand about enterprise applications and the mainframe and retaining that, and then cloud-native applications. What does it mean to you as you've had the vision for Azure and you've seen it evolve? Tell me how your thoughts have changed. You know, first of all, congratulations to you and the Arista team and all of your partners. And to our customers here, yeah, yeah. I want to really all congratulate them. All of your partners them. for, uh, you know, what has been a, obviously a, uh, an amazing, amazing journey, and uh, it's great to be partnered with you uh, on that journey as well, as you mentioned. Um, you know, the thing that... I've always, um, I just had a chance to meet uh, Andy and, um, you know, because I started at Sun, I guess, um, I've always felt that uh, distributed computing will be always distributed. I mean, in some sense, when I didn't think of uh, cloud um, as just one new destination, it was sort of a secular shift uh, in how we're going to have more and more computing uh, Clearly, the cloud brought with it uh, the attribute, especially around elasticity, uh, which we all needed. Because if you think about the types of problems we were trying to solve, uh, I thought uh, that that was going to completely change. I mean, if you look at the state of the art of, let's say, a training pipeline, uh, an AI training uh, pipeline that looks, you know, today, yeah. uh, it was just not possible with any kind of previous generation of compute architecture. And uh, so, now, though, if you look at what's the most interesting thing uh, that's happening uh, in the cloud, it's in the edge. In other words, uh, as data gets generated, it has gravity, and compute will migrate to where data is. And so this hybrid computing is not about sort of the old workload uh, migrating to the cloud and being hybrid. It's really a new architecture for distributed computing. You take a smart city, a smart factory, uh, an autonomous vehicle. Uh, it really requires you to think about your compute fabric. Yeah. Now, the problem is, or the challenge for all of us is, when you, you know, distributed computing is easy to say and nice to say, except it's hard, as you said. I mean, everything uh, from starting, at least in our case, how do you debug a distributed program is a nightmare. Uh, and that means you require real consistency, consistency at the identity level, consistency in uh, the core, I'll call it uh, the container of compute, uh, the consistency on the data layer, uh, the management plane, whether it's the security principles, whether it is, um, you know, or, you know, whether it's the network principles. In fact, the work we've also done in order to be able to sort of take uh, 
what is the policies that you are setting up on the network, and then how does it transverse uh, to the rest of the infrastructure? So that, I think, we're in the throes of making sure that we bring simplicity, scalability, uh, and taming the complexity of distributed computing, knowing that all of us need more distributed computing. And that's, I think, the world we live in. Yeah, and the edge is changing. Um, I know we all loosely use the word ML and AI, but it means something. There's much more you can do with the edge when you can put these right engines in there, right? You no, know, it's fascinating. I mean, like, for example, um, even something as simple as, uh, you know, people sort of say, well, we'll do training in the cloud and then we will do inference in the edge. Even that's changing because in, in, in other words, you need to be able to do even last mile or last layer training at the edge, uh, right? You see something for the first time in a smart city or a smart factory, uh, you want to be able to take that data, in fact, rerun the last layer training at the edge. So it's kind of like you need maybe you know, GPU, FPGA power in the edge, not just for inference, but for even training. And accommodating for that distributed training architecture uh, is sort of a new thing. And, and every year, every month, we see new patterns emerge based on what is happening out there. Yeah, it's a constant, no pun intended. Yeah. We're always learning. It's self-learning. Yeah. Let's talk specifically about Arista. Now, I know you've had a journey here for some time. And how do you see the, the networking impact of what you've done with Arista for your clients? What is the main reason they adopt your cloud, and how has Arista played a role? In yeah, I mean, for us, uh, the, the biggest um, advantage we've had in the cloud is that vision for distributed computing, uh, where we were able to meet. Like, for example, sometimes, Consumer internet properties teach you bad habits, right? Just because you have one high-scale service. If we sort of felt like, okay, Xbox, you know, and X, uh, X Cloud and Xbox Live are the only things we want to do, or even Microsoft 365 is the only thing we need to do, there's a particular design of how you would build, uh, whether it's the compute, the storage, or the network. The reality is the heterogeneous nature of the workloads uh, and what that may mean in east-west, north-south traffic will completely change uh, the core architecture. So that's where we needed even partners who were willing to help meet the real world needs, as I say, of distributed computing. Uh, and I think if I look at even our own evolution, Jay, she knows this well, which is, you know, the east-west was a big challenge. How do we scale that? Then we said, okay, how do we extend our WAN? Uh, and so if I look at, we needed someone who was able to push not only what is the core system design, what is the core software design for a unit of scale, that was changing by an order of magnitude every 12 months or so. Uh, and so that, I think, has been an amazing partnership. It was an engineer-to-engineer -engineer partnership where Very we much. built a lot of software together in order to be able to accommodate for what I think is this real-world need for what is compute storage network coming together. So as you look ahead, you know, I struggle with this too. You probably do as well. Do you think the cloud has to be a separate model, or do you think it... Uh, or from an operating perspective, or do you think we need to unify all these models? What is what is the start point and what is the end game? Right. I mean, to me, you have to unify. In other words, you again, it's all about having one. I mean, the dream is always to say, hey, there's one control plane uh, for my applications, and I'm able to set policy around it across multiple clouds. Right. That's really that's the dream. Uh, uh, the, but dream. the maturity of the technologies can. Really and that's right. And that's where I think what is required is some, you know, real work across even the vendor community. Uh, to be able to achieve that. So when I set some policies in one layer, does it actually transfer over? Uh, and that, I think, is the, the, the work that uh, we're all doing. Uh, and in fact, we, we we're having the conversation uh, with yeah. Paul from UBS as well. Even, for example, one of the big changes for us is how the core business of building IP, i.e. software, is changing, right? If you look at uh, what happens around GitHub and GitHub Enterprise and the continuous integration and the continuous deployment, you know, if you look at any organization's competitive advantage and competitiveness, it's dependent on how agile they are. And it's not just speed for speed's sake, it's the ability to turn the crank there without breaking anything uh, we in fact, having assurance that when they deploy this piece of code, nothing gets created which is now a new security hole or uh, break scale or what have you. So for us to think about the architecture 
as well as what are all the policies that we have set that come together in a coherent whole is, I think, the most important thing for us to do. Yeah. So when you look at all these different cloud models, what do you think is going to be the most transformative technology or behavior we need, we need to all do? What is it? Customers, Arista, you because there's always cool technology, but it's bringing it together, right? So there is one message you'd give us all. Yeah, so the way at least I uh, think about it, we as Microsoft think about it, is what, you know, if you sort of said, hey, what's your vision? How do you see computing evolve? Right. We think about it in three layers. We talked already a lot on what I would call the infrastructure, which is um, how do we think about the distributed computing plane from the cloud to the edge? which sort of fundamentally redefines compute storage network and everything around it. So that's kind of one layer. And as I said, uh, edge is one of the most critical areas. And like, just to kind of give you even a perspective on the edge, to me, when I think about Azure, it starts with whatever 54 data center regions we have around the world. But it ends with the MCU, the Azure Sphere, that might be in a microwave oven, right? So to <laughs> me, thinking of that as the one distributed plane is important. The layer about that, of course, is there's not an application any of us are building right. uh, that is not involve really machine learning at scale or AI. Like somebody said to me, if it's written in Python, it's AI, and if uh, rather if it's written in Python, it's ML, and if it's on PowerPoint, it's AI. Uh, <laughs> but it's clear so for much us. much for all the Java code we've all written, right? <laughs> but it's, it's clear for us that uh, we really need to think about high scale uh, machine learning, uh, whether it's on training or inference. And it changes again. Everything from all the assumptions of a data intensive, data parallel workload are very different than anything else that we've seen in the past. So therefore, how do you structure for it? Right. Then the thing that is changing is the experience layer. Uh, a HoloLens for us is not just one device. Uh, I'll give you two examples to sort of put this in perspective. Uh, we just launched Minecraft Earth. Um, you know, it's going to, or rather, we just announced it's going to launch later this year. It's just going to be a phenomenal. I mean, it's going to be on, um, uh, you know, your iOS devices, um, and uh, you can play it on something that is more immersive in VR, or you can do definitely Minecraft uh, Earth. Is Earth. That what we it's called. Be? Basically, the idea is you can play Minecraft in the real world. In fact, that we demoed it at uh, WWDC, um, and the the reason I bring that up is think about. What I think about it from an experience layer is a multi-sense, multi-device world. It's yeah. no longer about building an operating system even for one device. You really want to build an operating system, just like how we thought. Now, we never said we're going to build an operating system for one, uh, one compute node. Yeah, you we never said, envisioned that. Right, you, for, you just basically said, hey, we're going to build it for data center is the computer, or even all the data centers are the computer. Mm -hmm. We never did that for the end user compute. Uh, but the next phase is we're going to basically say, I'm going to start with speech on one device. I'm going to move to ink on another device, touch on another device. It's one app. Uh, and in fact, it's multiple people interacting with all of this. That's the vision, I think, of, of end user compute. Um, and so things like mixed reality or augmented reality are going to be at the forefront of it. I mean, I'll give you another enterprise application. In fact, right here in New York, um, there's an Italian furniture store uh, called Natuzzi. They just opened a small store with now has 40% more throughput or revenue than any other store. You ask them why it is, what they said is, okay, you know what, we want to solve the following, which is we want to have infinite catalog in our store. So they use HoloLens as a way for you to be able to have the store be infinitely bigger than the physical space because you have all the furniture you want, but you can create that furniture space for yourself. Then they said, you know what, we won't stop there. You can bring your house to the store, right? So literally, because of a, a way for you to be able to upload your home to the cloud and then have that physical space. And then, of course, whatever you've done in the store, you can go back and take it to your home. So this is not, so literally, it's taking presence, right, right? which has been the ultimate uh, app for anything that people wanted to do in communications and sort of transforming it uh, in a very, very fundamental way. My final question to you, um, and, and I'll, uh, is everyone's a leader of some capacity in the room. And uh, that's something we've all really seen you do and been inspired by. 
What advice do you have for all of us leaders who haven't had to do the difficult tasks you have of navigating a huge ship in different directions? What does leadership mean to you? And give us some tips there. I mean, first of all, Jayashree, people like you who've sort of created you know, massive <laughs> organizations out of nothing is, you know, in fact, your slide you. that you put up has been inspirational for me. I mean, I mean, one of the things that I feel uh, I learn a lot from is watching uh, leaders like yourself and many in the room um, achieve that, you know, what is leadership ultimately? It's that ability to raise the bar and go through that hard process of change. Um, and at least there are three things I've learned uh, which I think define leadership. I look for it in myself uh, and then in the people that I want to surround myself with. One is, you know, leaders are fascinating that they can go into an ambiguous, uncertain circumstance and bring clarity, yeah. right? Leaders are not those, just because they're, you know, everyone's smart. But if you are smart and you go into an uncertain and unpredictable situation and create more confusion, that's not leadership. <laughs> Uh, so the first thing is, how are you bringing clarity when none exists? The second thing that leaders also do is they bring energy all around them. Yeah. Um, you know, there's sometimes people will come to we me. We saw that today. Ever since you've been here, there's been energy. <laughs> no, but there are times when you, you know, somebody will come to you and say, you know what, you know, Satya, my team is awesome. I'm good. Everybody else is shit. That's not leadership. Right? Um, that is well, not. We, we say that about our competition. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it all work is about bringing people together uh, customers, partners, your own sort of or different functional groups inside the company. And leaders are ones who know how to bring the multiple constituents together. And the last thing, at least to me, uh, is you know, leaders make like you described it, make things happen. In other words, we live in a constrained world. In fact, you could even say we live in an over-constrained world. Uh, and the question is, leaders are folks who figure out a way uh, to unconstrain themselves um, and to make sure that they're making those judgment calls, those trade-offs that drive success. Right. Uh, and that's the art of leadership. And it's not something that you just read, you I practice, you fail nine times no, out of 10, but you learn. Uh, and that's at least how I like to think of evaluating myself. Did I create clarity when none existed? Did I create energy? Was I able to unconstrain? Make those hard calls, right? Because everybody likes to try and sort of say, look, if only give me perfect conditions and I'll perform. And guess what? That world doesn't exist. Or by the time you get all that data, it's too late That's right. to make the right decision. That's right. Well, I tell you, this is very inspiring. And, and I think a leader also has to change their mind. It's not just a woman's right to do that. Once in a while, you might make it the wrong way and That's you right. have to correct it, right? That's right. Well, I know uh, you and I share some other passions. I understand you like cricket a lot. Um, uh, it's the game, for those of you who don't know, where we run up and down rather than round and round. And uh, there's, there's, uh, there's actually one coming up here where... Uh, you That's, know, it's going on right now. There's a World yeah. Cup going on, which yeah. uh, is, is it's streaming everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Another massive opportunity for the cloud and data yeah. and networking. Who's your favorite cricketer? Mine was in the 70s. Most of them won't know who, they, who he is. Who's yours? Oh, here's an interesting one. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I met a South African uh, recently. And, um, and uh, so now, just because every, the word has gotten around that uh, I love cricket, pretty much every cricket playing nation sent me their t-shirt going into the World <laughs> Cup saying cheer for us. And it's like, so it's sort of like the greatest collection of cricket memorabilia is something I've collected in the last five months. Uh, and it's just a dream come true for me. But so therefore, I don't know what I'm rooting for or whom I'm rooting for anymore. Uh, but you know, one thing I must say though, talking about leadership, Sport is one place where I learned every lesson that needed to be learned. Yeah. Uh, and in particular, uh, the, the various uh, captains of cricket in sort of the level of cricket I played uh, taught me the most of how to build confidence. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's I always, I have said this, I wrote this even in my book, which is there was this one particular incident which has perhaps shaped me the most around leadership. I, you know, I was, I was a, it was a terrible bowler and- Are you were um, a bowler, fast a, or a spinner? No, I was a spinner. Okay. Um, and I was bowling complete trash one day. <laughs> and then this captain of mine, uh, he sort of 
took over from me, and you got like, I can't explain the rules of cricket, so it's complicated, but uh, bear with me. So, and then he, you know, got a wicket, but then he gave me the ball, you know, he let me continue gave my bowling. Back. And then okay. I took a lot of wickets, and that was like the best highlight of my short-lived cricket career. But <laughs> nevertheless, the thing that I always thought about is why did he do that? Yeah. Uh, he could have easily said, God, this guy is useless. Let me just completely get rid of him. Okay. Uh, and that would have been the end of my enthusiasm in cricket. But I felt like he sort of felt like I, he needed me for the season. Uh, and this is high school cricket. And that, that particular captain went on to play a lot of first class cricket. But nevertheless, but the fact that he had that insight. He took a bet on uh, you. Even took though... a bet on and like understood that leaders are people who ultimately are really making those calls of how to increase confidence uh, around them is something that has stuck around with me. Uh, of course, you've got to make hard calls. Uh, you can't let anybody you know, who's not performing uh, continue. Uh, but there is also that art of saying, no, what does performance look like? And how do I build enough confidence in the person so that Give they can Give them a chance, on? extract the most out of them and see. Yeah, that's it. Who would have thought that I'd come to a Rista conference and talk about cricket? But oh, here we are. Oh, it's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> it is a fascinating thing. You know, as CEOs, we lead stressful lives. Uh, and sometimes it can feel very alone. I'm very blessed with a great Arista family that doesn't make me feel alone. Uh, as well as a personal family. What do you do for fun? You know, it's, it, I mean, for sure, uh, somebody here, when we talk a lot about what is this work-life balance, and all of us lead uh, lives where that balance is so hard, um, and in some sense, even perhaps, I would say, sometimes feels unachievable, and I've tried to frame it even, uh, uh, maybe not as so hard and so NP complete, <laughs> Uh, that you never get around it, but nevertheless, uh, think of it more as harmony. Yeah. Uh, it helps. Uh, it, so, for example, even the uh, time I spend with my uh, children, am I really there? Uh, you know, I ask myself that question. Presence yeah. uh, matters. Uh, are you really untethered from all of our devices? Right. Um, and so, I'm trying to, you know, make as much of a conscious choice. Uh, to actually be there. Uh, quite frankly, it's even in even in commercial settings with meetings. Right. Uh, are you really like, for, for example, uh, are you really listening uh, to the unmet, unarticulated needs of people you're partnered with, and so on? I think it requires a lot of mental uh, practice uh, to do that. But it also de-stresses you because you don't have that anxiety uh, or information anxiety. Uh, the other thing that I do, uh, I must say, because this morning I had like a, a great chance to go run in the Central Park, uh, is that's the one thing, irrespective of what time I got in, uh, wherever I am. That's and, great. Uh, I go for a it's run. A stress reliever, right? It for sure is. It sure is. Well, I want to say this has been a wonderful session. I don't know about you guys, but let's give a real Thank you. warm Thank you so applause. Much. Thank you. Here you go. Everyone's standing up for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going, to be, uh, we're going to be distributing some Pioneer Awards throughout the day for our customers. And the first one goes to you. All right. Thank um, you so much. Thank you so much. And we wrote a book on the making of Arista. The foreword, as you'll read, is greatly inspired by you for me. So it's, um, may you keep hitting refresh and win lots of wickets. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.